Japan's electromagnetic railgun debuted, potentially countering Chinese hypersonic missiles. This month, the Japan Maritime Self Defense Force tested a 6 meter long, 40 millimeter caliber railgun on the Asuka test ship, accelerating small projectiles to Mach 7.3, capable of altering regional power dynamics. This reflects contrasting strategic and military approaches between Japan and China. The challenge began with hypersonic missiles. In 2019, China unveiled the DF-17, claiming a terminal speed of Mach 10 in unpredictable trajectories, followed by the YJ-21 and the DF-27, promoted as aircraft carrier threats, forming a hypersonic arsenal. These missiles complicate interception, though their threat is somewhat overstated. Ukraine's battlefield provides insight. Russia's Kinzhal and Zircon missiles face U.S. Patriot systems, achieving only a 50 to 60 percent interception rate compared to over 90 percent for conventional missiles. Intercepting one hypersonic missile often requires three Patriot missiles, costing $15 million, highlighting inefficiency and high costs. In a potential East China Sea or Taiwan Strait conflict, a simultaneous launch of DF-17 YJ-21 and DF-27 at Mach 10 would challenge Japan and U.S. Aegis systems. This dilemma drives Japan and the U.S. to explore solutions like lasers or Japan's railgun. Japan's railgun, akin to electromagnetic catapults, uses a strong magnetic field to propel 320-gram projectiles to Mach 7.3, surpassing the Patriot's Mach 4.1. For a Mach 5 to 10 hypersonic missile, the relative speed exceeds Mach 15, enabling kinetic destruction without explosives. However, the projectiles lack self-guidance. Japan may employ barrage interception, firing multiple guns to create a dense firepower network. Japan's railgun fires 6 to 8 rounds per minute, limiting its firepower. However, equipping 12 ships with railguns could launch 36 to 48 projectiles in 30 seconds, forming a barrage based on firing angles. Even agile DF missiles would struggle to evade, with a high success rate for intercepting 1-2 to two DF-17s. Against saturation attacks, the railgun's low cost and rapid fire could sustain 12 minutes of combat, offering exceptional cost effectiveness. Compact enough for frigates or destroyers, the railgun transforms ships into stealthy, formidable air defense platforms, deployable on land as well. This strategy challenges China's DF missiles significantly. The railgun's cost is a major advantage. Each projectile in launch costs thousands of dollars, with interceptions ranging from tens to hundreds of thousands, far less than the millions for traditional missile interceptors, akin to a car versus a house. Despite its potential, the railgun's barrel wears out after 20 minutes, requiring spares for combat. Japan could optimize this by deploying 12 additional ships to maintain fire while others replace barrels. Such a deployment could diminish China's hypersonic advantage. While feasible in theory, its success hinges on several factors. Intercepting hundreds of missiles requires an advanced fire control system to calculate precise projectile timing and trajectories for an effective barrage. Developing this complex software demands significant investment, and Japan's technical capacity remains a question. Equipping 24 ships with railguns involves costly modifications and maintenance, requiring paramilitary approval and public support. If Japan fully commits, the Western Pacific's military balance could shift. China's electromagnetic railgun, a large caliber cannon, offers high power and long range but requires substantial energy, limiting it to large warships or land-based power supplies, reducing its flexibility compared to distributed systems. China faces challenges in countering Japan's railguns. Electronic jammers or decoy missiles aimed at disrupting fire control systems are ineffective at long range and have too brief a window at close range. Electromagnetic interference encounters similar limitations. China could employ saturation attacks, launching hundreds of hypersonic missiles to overwhelm Japan's railgun defenses, allowing some to penetrate. However, with only about 2,000 hypersonic missiles, Repeated waves of hundreds will be unsustainable. Neither hypersonic missiles nor railgun defenses fully dominate. 
a prolonged conflict would exhaust both sides, making escalation undesirable. A first island chain conflict would involve the U.S., South Korea, Russia, and Japan destabilizing East Asia. Negotiations offer the best path, preserving dignity and stability. G20 diplomacy could ease tensions through energy cooperation and shared fishery resources, trading economic gains for military de-escalation. The Western Pacific's dynamics have shifted over the past two decades. The U.S. once held unchallenged dominance, but now every naval transit or aircraft sortie heightens global scrutiny. This shift from calm to tension reflects intense strategic competition. In the early 2000s, the U.S. Navy maintained one aircraft carrier and four amphibious assault ships in the Western Pacific, while China had no comparable assets, confining its military to the first island chain. In 2003, China launched the 052C-class destroyer, followed by the J-10 fighter jets deployment in 2004. These advancements, though understated, mark early steps in China's strategic military modernization. China's market appeared open to the West, but subsidies for state-owned enterprises and mandatory technology transfers restricted access, contributing to significant U.S. trade deficits and 3.7 million job losses. Congressional hearings confirmed China's limited compliance with WTO market opening commitments, raising concerns in Washington as China bolstered its military while delaying economic promises. In 2009, China's Nine Dash Line claim over much of the South China Sea provoked international criticism. The U.S. interpreted this as China's shift from economic growth to challenging the Western Pacific's established order. China's actions in the 2000s altered first island chain dynamics. In 2011, the U.S. launched the Pivot to Asia strategy, enhancing security partnerships with Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines, rotating Marines through Australia, and increasing its regional military presence. After Xi Jinping assumed power in 2013, China intensified its South China Sea activities. Extensive land reclamation in the Spartley Islands, including rapid construction of airfields and radar stations, provoked strong responses from regional nations and the U.S. Despite China's pledge against militarization, it confirmed weapons deployment on the islands in 2015. The U.S. perceived China's actions as contradictory, endangering navigation freedom and regional stability, prompting stronger measures. Supported by the U.S., the Philippines challenged China's Nine Dash Line claim in an international tribunal, which ruled in July 2016 that the claim lacked legal basis, escalating U.S.-China tensions in the South China Sea. That summer, tensions peaked. The U.S. deployed the Reagan and Stennis carrier groups, warships, and 150 aircraft to the South China Sea, showcasing overwhelming military presence. China responded with H-6K bombers, elite naval forces, and DF-21D anti-ship missiles entering high alert. This marked the closest U.S.-China military standoff since the Cold War. The Obama administration's decision to withdraw was criticized as a strategic error, given China's less advanced navy and early-stage hypersonic systems. This retreat contributed to ongoing Western Pacific tensions. During Trump's first term, he adopted a firm stance against China, primarily in economic and trade areas, without establishing comprehensive military containment. Analysts suggested that a re-elected Trump might have pursued more aggressive policies in 2021, possibly including military measures. The 2020 election outcome halted this trajectory, providing China with a respite. The Biden administration maintained a tough posture towards China, but hesitated at critical moments. The August 2022 crisis following Pelosi's Taiwan visit was pivotal. China deployed J-16D electronic warfare aircraft to create a jamming network around the Taiwan Strait, but the South China Morning Post reported these systems were outmatched by U.S. Growler electronic warfare capabilities. This presented a strategic opportunity, yet Biden's restraint allowed China to regroup. China's leadership, alarmed by the setback, prioritized electronic warfare and stealth technology development. The military rapidly integrated AI advancements, achieving significant progress. The Trump administration now confronts a heavy fortified Chinese military with challenges far greater than before. China's military evolution from the 2003 052 destroyer to the 2019 DF-17 hypersonic missile 
and today's AI-enhanced warfare has reshaped Western Pacific security, this carefully orchestrated rise reflects a long-term strategic approach. China's weapon development prioritizes offensive systems, such as hypersonic weapons, aimed at countering the U.S. and reshaping the international order. Despite official claims of a defensive national defense policy, its military trajectory suggests a more assertive strategic intent. A former U.S. Department of Defense official stated that the U.S. seeks to maintain regional peace and the international order in the Western Pacific, not to defeat China. In contrast, China's hypersonic missile programs target U.S. naval forces designed to prevail in potential conflicts. The U.S., despite its advanced technological capabilities, has not extensively pursued similar hypersonic systems. This divergence underscores differing strategic priorities. One preserves the existing order, while the other challenges the regional power balance. The CCP's military is now quite formidable, and if conflicts were to occur, the U.S. would need to accelerate preparations, negotiating while simultaneously preparing for war. The Western Pacific's military dynamics highlight the contrasting strategic cultures of China and the U.S. China recently promoted its death ray satellite laser technology, claiming it can destroy satellites within a 100-kilometer radius, suggesting an ability to disrupt U.S. satellite communications and weaken command and control in a conflict. However, this claim lacks credibility under scrutiny. The vastness of Earth's orbit makes close satellite proximity unlikely, and targeting fast-moving satellites requires advanced tracking and positioning systems beyond laser technology. Experts view this as psychological warfare with questionable technical feasibility. The U.S. military has quietly prepared for such threats, incorporating no satellite warfare scenarios and exercises in developing regional communication networks to maintain command and control without satellites. These efforts are minimally publicized, emphasizing practical combat readiness. Japan's electromagnetic railgun development mirrors this restrained approach. Focusing on practical challenges rather than publicizing breakthroughs, the Ministry of Defense issued only a brief technical summary after successful tests, avoiding exaggerated claims. History demonstrates that battlefields reward capability over propaganda. In future conflicts, the pragmatic, low-profile strategies of the U.S. and Japan may yield unexpected advantages, while reliance on overstated claims with technical shortcomings could lead to setbacks. This contrast reflects distinct strategic priorities and values.